Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway. On this Tuesday, we bring you your K-State recruiting update. Look, initially, we were just going to talk Brad Stanier's commitment and bring you uh, a recruiting show later in the week, but it, it seems to make sense just to put them all together because there's a lot going on right now on that front, and so we want to kind of maximize what we can give everybody here. But let's start with the latest commitment for K-State football. They add Brad Stanier a uh, defensive end out of Texas, and he was one of the guys that it felt like might be on the verge of popping, and then yesterday, lo and behold, here he comes. Not rated yet, but K-State is able to add him. Why should people uh, respect the Brad Stanier pickup? I think it's because you just look at what K-State has done at defensive end pretty much since Chris Kleiman has got to K-State, and that you don't see those guys bust truly that often i mean look at the 2023 class for example all three guys in that class uh played a little bit against ut martin travis bates came in as a transfer got a lot of playing time brendan mott was a walk-on he started to play a lot more cody self same thing so it, it, it's just one of those things where case has done such a good job at defensive end and i and i didn't even talk about uh felix andy dk uzama and that that, that I think it's something to get excited about. And he's kind of like that future of the defensive end position. And we'll kind of get into that uh, a little bit more. But I, I think that with how he, with him still being unranked, I don't think that it's that big of a deal. He was one of uh, the staff's favorite defensive ends. Uh, although the, the offer came a little bit later. Uh, I think that it, it shows how much of a priority he was that Casey offered him and then immediately tried to get an official visit scheduled and got it scheduled for the first game and then got the job done before any other team could come knocking. Well, so this is commitment number 18 in the class for K-State, and they they add another uh, defensive end. Where does he kind of fit into the puzzle that they're putting together with what they've done up front defensively in this class? Yeah, I think that he is probably a, a Travis Bates, Chidi Obiizer type defensive end. I mean, it, he's listed at 235 right now, but he was probably closer to 245 uh, when I saw him over the weekend uh, during his official visit than 235. Like he, He's a big dude and can get up to that 270, 275 range. And, and I think that that's what K State was looking for in that second defensive end in this class because you saw. Uh, some some guys be being targeted like uh, Sean Hammerbeck and Cade Peterzak uh, of the Dakota schools uh, that you saw both of them come in on official visits over uh, the summer. And then now you see Brad Stanier, kind of the same type of defensive end where you want a heavier one because they already have a guy that will probably be more of a pass rush specialist in uh, Dalton Knapp. And now you see Brad Stanier come in and be that heavier kind of strong side defensive end type of player. So in terms of where this this thing goes once Stanier gets to K-State now, uh, what what is a, a rough timeline look like? It can be hard to you know kind of assess that, but uh, ultimately where, where do you think it lands in terms of him actually getting his first crack at a rotation and how that would appear? It, it would probably be more towards after a red shirt and you kind of assess from there. I mean, there there's a lot of depth on Casey defensive line right now. I mean, we, we saw that in week one. We've heard that kind of all throughout uh, training camp in the summer, that the defensive end room is pretty loaded. Uh, so for a younger player to come in, it's probably going to take a little bit of time and, and to play that other role, that big defensive end role. It's going to come down to how fast uh, can he put on the weight that is necessary to play his position. Uh, but after a redshirt year, you kind of evaluate and kind of see where it goes. Uh, I, I mean, there, there will be a path to more playing time after a redshirt season because he'll probably have uh, some older guys graduate in front and just some natural attrition could uh, happen at K-State because K-State's susceptible to it just like every other school in the country. Uh, but you kind of look at that and you think, okay, redshirt, as, after a redshirt year, you kind of just see what happens. And I, I think that that's just kind of where it is for a lot of freshmen because it, it is hard to play as a freshman when there are guys that are third, fourth, and fifth years and now sixth, seventh 
even ninth years if you're uh, at the University of Miami, guys in front of you. Yeah, it'll be interesting to to kind of fall. I just you know we we get a lot of these guys that uh, we we showcase on here, and and I think some people confuse like mainly uh, I think uh, people from other fan bases when they they watch these they think that this is propping every player up, every recruit is the best player ever. No, no, no that's not that's not what the point of this is. Like, yes, K State and Chris Kleiman has a pretty good track record of these guys coming through and turning into good players, but it's highlighting what was seen for this guy to get the offer and then become one of the members of the recruiting class at a place like K-State. The same that, you know, you would if it was, we were talking about Oklahoma State or Arizona or Utah or, or you know, UCF, whatever it would be. It's highlighting the traits of, of what these guys might do. And so, I yeah, I, I want to, I always want to give people perspective on uh, guys that we talk about on here. There's a chance that we don't say their name for three years after signing day, um, unless they end up in the transfer portal or something. Uh, and that's not what I'm saying say Brad Stanier is going to be, but. Oh, I was going to say that there's a chance that some of these guys don't ever play at KC. And that, that, that's not a bad thing because you can't, nobody ever goes 100% in a recruiting class. Yeah. If somebody does, that means that that team has probably won a national title like three years in a row. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, so that is what we got on Brad Stanier right there. 18th commit of the class for K State. Uh, you want to put a timeline on when we might see uh, the next commitment for the Wildcats? Uh, probably in a few weeks, maybe next month. I, I think that Darren Whitaker of uh, Omaha, Nebraska is still close, but still not quite over the finish line yet. Uh, but I still think that he will end up in the K State class. All right, sounds good. Book it there from Drew. Uh, moving on, more football recruiting news. The Wildcats hosted a bevy of visitors for the opening game against UT Martin. Uh, anything stand out to you about the guys that were in town or anything that you heard from the players in regards to their uh, thoughts on the opening game? I know Brad Stanier in the, uh, uh, probably had some thoughts, and I know that you also talked to Hunter Higgins. Uh, from from May South, which had uh, encouraging, I mean, really a good game to go see defensive ends play if you're Hunter Higgins. Uh, so what did you make yeah. of the recruiting weekend overall for K-State? Yeah, in general, it was a, it was a really good uh, weekend. I think that it'll be probably one of the better uh, recruiting weekends that K-State hosts, and that's in part due to Kansas high school football not having a game last weekend, so it kind of frees up a lot of time for a lot of these guys. Uh, having probably who they really want to prioritize in that 2026 Kansas class uh, come and come to the first game is a big deal. Tyron Parker was in town. Uh, Hunter Higgins was in town. Braden Wilms, JJ Donegan, and Ian Primer. Having all, all of those guys back, I think, is always a big deal. And especially with Donegan, because again, even though he's from Manhattan, it's not like a slam dunk that K State will land him, but to be able to get him on campus for the first game and have him scheduled for a few other visits during the fall, big deal. Uh, having Ian Primer being there and being able to talk with Lincoln Cure is another big deal. And, and when you get the commits back on campus, I think that it really lets, highlights like, okay, this is why I made this choice. This is probably why this was uh, the right place for me to be. And, and it's always fun. And I know that there was some talk about Oregon potentially working on getting Lincoln Cura visit. But when you see him come back to K-State and kind of go out of his way to talk to Ian Primer and talk to AJ Devonta, I think that that's yeah. a big deal and something that probably wasn't highlighted enough. Yeah, and not just talking with him, but also, I mean, teaching him how to, to Wabash and everything. Uh, so, yeah, that that's a uh, that's that's notable as well. And, and honestly... Uh, a really good segue into the next thing that we need to hit on when we're talking about recruiting uh, right now for K-State basketball because uh, the Wildcats, while it wasn't any significant news on DeBonza, and we don't necessarily anticipate that for a while because uh, he's he's kind of got it narrowed down already, we did get some news on maybe where their standing is for Darren Peterson, uh, who, again, really talented basketball player. We've talked about this. Uh, numerous times throughout, I don't know, the last couple of weeks with just how talented 
some of these guys are that are uh, in this basketball class coming up this year that K-State is trying to get in on. Uh, but Darren Peterson named his top four schools, and uh, K-State did end up making the list there. Uh, so you can tell everybody the other schools that Peterson threw in there and then kind of your thoughts on what this might mean for K-State. Because, again, we preface this with saying that in the RPM, Peterson's got – almost 90% of it to Kansas. It feels like a strong KU lean, but K-State at least has made some thinking go on there. So uh, what should be noted about the top recruit in Darren Peterson? Yeah, so his top four is K-State, USC, uh, Kansas, and Ohio State. I, I'm not real positive that it's going to go K-State's way. I would honestly be pretty surprised at this point uh, and it kind of seems like a two-horse race with Ohio State and Kansas uh, but K-State does get a crack and made again if you keep making the cuts here eventually something is going to go your way in the future uh, and K-State will get a visit from Peterson uh, September 27th for it's it's around the Oklahoma State uh, football game so we'll see another good atmosphere in Manhattan and kind of go from there. But I would say that's probably a two-horse race with KU and Ohio State, K-State probably third. But, again, you get the visit and anything can happen. So as long as you're still kind of in the mix and tell people sign on the dotted line, it's, it's really up in the air. Yeah, just have him talk to Coleman Hawkins and then uh, realize that how much money is there, and, and there you go. You're in the mix. Uh, just like that. Anything else recruiting wise that uh, you, you want to make note on before we get out of here and then set the stage for uh, what is to come the rest of this week uh, at KSO? Because we'll have plenty of other things going on uh, this week and kind of giving everybody an idea of uh, what to look forward to. But we'll have headlines and everything else uh, going on in the build up to uh, the two lane game. Yeah, I'd just add that I was at uh, R.J. Collins' first game of the season uh, Friday night at Staley High School, taking on Oak Park, who is a pretty talented team uh, themselves and have a tight end that's committed to Utah, actually. Uh, so kind of got to see both of them. Uh, talking to R.J. afterwards, I got kind of mixed vibes. I, I still think that he ends up signing with K-State, but I think that that USC trip will probably go on. And again when nothing is really finalized until the dotted line, if you're thinking about taking trips other places, it kind of throws a little bit of a, a mixed reaction into the crowd. Uh, but he, he, he also did say, though, that he has family in California and, and kind of did say that it was just like a free trip to California and a place that he's never been before. Uh, so in, in that respect, I think that he still ends up signing with K-State. I mean, his his dad was kind of, recruiting AJ Devonta for K-State uh, shortly after the weekend was over. So I think that that's not insignificant and think that playing closer to home and having his parents uh, met at K-State, I think that that probably plays a little bit into why I think that K-State will still end up signing him. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's one of those things too. It's good to hear uh, just kind of the straightforwardness of, uh, kind of just doing it for the trip there. Like that's probably not the most exciting thing to hear if you're USC. Uh, but yes, while it would be great if the guy was like, Hey, I'm shutting down these trips. D Y and I kind of talked about it. Like this is, this recruitment is different from Lincoln cure. Like he had a kind of a full year of this to play out with these high level suitors. It was, Hey, K state got in there and they were really the only ones for this period of time. He had the ties to K state. So he makes the decision, but you still want that experience and to kind of see everything. And at the end of the day, like RJ Collins is not doing the best thing for himself. If he doesn't at least enlighten himself to other power for opportunities that are there. So I understand it, but uh, I think the thing that people should take the most weight with is kind of the understanding that uh, he's going into it with a thought process of, Hey, if they're going to let, if they're going to pay for my trip out to California, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take advantage of it. So It'll be interesting to kind of follow that one uh, moving forward. Yeah, I'd also add that there's still no date on that USC trip. And I think that the longer that that goes without a date being finalized, it's obviously a lot better for K-State in the long run. Yeah, 
No doubt about it. All right, before we get out of here, I want to remind everybody that K-State still gearing up for that game over in Ireland. Uh, probably doing a better job of preparing for it than me, who still has not uh, gotten a passport or anything figured out. Not Don't even know how to go about that process yet. Uh, but there's no better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So get on it. Do a better job than me of planning your Irish getaway. And uh, hopefully we'll see you over there next year in August for the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. So that will do it for Drew and I today. Uh, I, we'll see how DY is feeling. Maybe he's back tomorrow. Maybe us again with your headlines. But we'll get to those on a Wednesday and get into the back half of the week. Start getting ready for K-State and Tulane. The Wildcats moved up to number 17 in the AP Top 25 earlier today as well. I'm sure we'll have some conversations and thoughts on that, uh, especially other things going on with K-State football as we get closer to game number two down in New Orleans. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Vo. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online. You can head over to On3, find kstateonline.com for continued coverage of the Cats. <laughs>